Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4101, talking about the adventures of Safe Ben Tiet Son, which is a work that I don't really know that well. I've read it only once before. Uh, I also haven't been able to find good manuscript images of the story. This is one from 1783 at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and it's a two volume set that has uh, probably most, if not the entire work in it. The actual work though is much longer than the translation you're reading for this class. We're reading only the first of three sections of it. I don't believe the rest of it has been translated. And even what we're reading in English has a lot of paraphrases of parts that the translators thought weren't particularly interesting. So for those of you who are really enthusiastic about this work, uh, there was a full edition published, I believe, in Egypt in the late 19th century. It's probably available online. I'll look for it and provide it to the class if you read Arabic and if you want to look at the original. So. Um, the work itself is probably produced in the 15th or 16th centuries. It's certainly no earlier than 1372 because the chief antagonists or one of the chief antagonists of Saif, who's a king named Saif Red, who's the king of Habash, he's based on an Ethiopian king who died in 1372. So basically it's a historical person. And that means that this work is technically post-medieval. It dates to after the Middle Ages. But in terms of his genre and the kind of storytelling it, it engages in, it, it feels very medieval to me. So the actual events, though, are set in what would have been the, uh, the sixth century, the historical Saif ben Diyatzan, uh, was a Yemenite king who lived prior to uh, the prior to Muhammad. So basically, this is he's engaging in a kind of Islam before Islam. And his enemies are, of course, unbelievers. They worship Saturn. So this is set up as uh, impartially as, as a religious war. But technically, um, uh, Saif is, is sort of a Muslim before it's, it's possible to be a Muslim. Um, but really, although this work is sort of set between Yemen and what we now think of as modern day Ethiopia, called Habash in this work. It's really kind of an origin of Egypt story where it's about Saif Ben on getting a book that's going to divert the Nile so it runs away from Abyssinia through the middle of Egypt and thereby allows Egypt to become the power that it is. And it's produced um, really to kind of celebrate Egyptian, Egyptian might and Egyptian power by talking about this Yemenite king who uh, fought against Ethiopians. And that's kind of interesting in itself. So keeping track of of all this may be hard for some of you. Look at the end of the PDF if you're looking at it in a PDF. And there's a list of names back there that will have all the major characters. You maybe want to print that out and have that by yourself when you're when you're reading. Uh, you may even want to print out the motive index. So a, a motif or a motive is a is a kind of common element that you find in many, many stories. And this lists the various common elements that you find in here. And for example, you notice that Saif is discovered by a gazelle. He's left in the wilderness and saved by an animal and saved in fact by a, by a gazelle. And that should of course be immediately familiar to you from the story of Haib and Yachtin. And we find this kind of story many, many places. So that motif index will list all the kind of common elements of storytelling. Those of you who are familiar with the website TV Tropes can think of a motif index as a kind of scholarly version of that. One thing I'm gonna talk about <coughs> today though, is I'm gonna talk about the curse of Noah at length, which is kind of a really strange and kind of upsetting element about this story. So. But first, let me just introduce you to, to the genre. So technically, I, I'm told this is a, a Syrah or Syrat. And those of you who read Arabic, I've got the, the actual word there. And it's a, a word that can translate as a way of life or a biography. And most of these uh, works are centered around uh, the Prophet Muhammad and his uh, companions. And so there's lots of stories about that, about military, military expeditions and so forth. And then you have a genre of literature that's called, called a kind of a folk sirah like this, which are these kind of tales of adventures and daring do by people with, with magic and so forth. In that regard, as a medievalist who's trained in the literature of uh, old French, Middle English, and Latin, I'm familiar with works like Yvain, Eric and Anid, Tristan, uh, Herzog Ernst, Duke Ernst in German, Bevis of Hampton, Persephorest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that all these works have a similar feel to Saif Ben Diyatzan. That is, I'm, I'm giving you instead of these, um, these works originally in Old French or German or, or Latin, 
a work written originally in Arabic, but the kind of storytelling it's engaged in, where it's set up as a religious conflict with stories of, of knights falling in love with, uh, with women, with fighting monsters, the travels across you know, wastelands and so forth. All that stuff is things you will find in, in medieval European romance as well. So to me, this is all extremely familiar. I don't find it so unusual. It's just extremely fun and, and interesting. Um, the way that this kind of genre of literature works, uh, though it's different from modern novels, is that the characters are very flat. We, you don't have emotional depth or emotional richness. There's no sense these characters have a subconscious. So it really doesn't make sense really to ask whether a character is really in love with somebody or is really angry or really cowardly. If the text wants you to know something about a character's motivations, it'll tell you. So we know that Saif Ben Dietzan's mother wants to kill him as we're told that many times, there's no guesswork here. And why does she wanna kill him? Because she wants political power. There's no hidden secret psychological motivation. That's just not how these characters work. So you're making a mistake if you read this text as though it's something say written by Jane, Jane Austen or Henry James or Toni Morrison. It really doesn't have those kinds of characters that you find in modern novels. Uh, they're interested more in what the characters do. Action is the most important thing. And the characters are all, generally always the best of whatever they are, the most beautiful woman, the most brave knight, etc. because that's just more exciting. And if you wanna think of characters like that, look at modern superhero movies, which I think are in some ways reviving many of the elements of, of the medieval genre of romance. And you can also pose the question of what's realistic. Is this actually realistic? Well, a story with gazelles that find children in the wilderness and take care of them, and of genies and ghouls and magicians and so forth, uh, and ancient prophecies doesn't really feel that, that realistic to us. But um, the question of what counts as realism is, is historically specific. It changes over time. So what counts as realistic in a novel by, say, Toni Morrison, where there are ghosts who talk and do things, is that is beloved unrealistic? No, I think it's a realistic representation of trauma uh, and the problems of history. Rules for, for realism in Dickens, uh, for example, are, are different. In the novels of Charles Dickens, coincidence rules the day, right? And that's also a form of realism for that particular kind of novel. And this, what would be unrealistic is if a knight or a hero behaved in a cowardly fashion, or if they were ugly, or if the women were anything less than the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, that would be unrealistic. Realism is something we can look at in terms of genre. And that's why it's one of the reasons it's important to know what the genre is. So now on to the curse of Noah. So if you don't know, this uh, has its roots in the book of Genesis, uh, which is what it's called in English. And this and this this is a story about Noah after the flood, where he plants vines and makes wine from the vine, and and gets drunk. And as he passes out, um, he's lying naked inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards and they saw not their father's nakedness. So they back up and they cover him up. And Noah woke from the wine, so he wakes up from his, his being passed out. And uh, he curses uh, Canaan, the son of Ham, and says he shall be a servant of servants to his brethren, and then he, he blesses the other sons. Um, so what this story is about in its original version is it concerns uh, the Jewish war with the Canaanites. And that, and it's saying that the Canaanites who were dwelling in ancient Palestine were uh, the land of Canaan, were going to become the, uh, the servants to the conquering Jews. And so there's a story about local and immediate politics. And that's all it means in the original context. But that's not, of course, what happens in later centuries. So one of the things I read in preparation for this talk um, was an article by Benjamin Broid or Browda, uh, the son, Sons of Noah and the Construction of Ethnic and Geolo Geographical Identities in the Medieval and Early Modern Periods, an article from 1997. It's quite long, it's 41 pages long, but it's extremely good. And one of the things he observes is that uh, Ham, that's a particular son of Noah, um, is 
is assigned to all kinds of different roles, really up to the point when transatlantic slavery uh, hits and becomes a feature of the modern world, in fact, the defining feature of the modern world, at which point in the common commentary on the Bible, Ham becomes the ancestor of Black Africans, and that the curse of Noah becomes a way for white supremacists to say, look, the Bible provides justification for the enslavement of Black people. And it shows that we white people are meant to rule. So it's a way for them to construct the categories of whiteness and blackness as transhistorical categories. And they justify that through a particularly tendentious reading of the Bible, which again, as you see, there's nothing about skin color in the original biblical story. But if we look as Browder did at earlier material, we see that this reference to skin color really isn't there in a lot of the earlier material either. So here's an, uh, a work from Afghanistan. It's a universal history and it's an illustration of Noah's Ark. So this is an Islamic work and there is Noah in the middle. There are three of his sons, Ham, Japheth and, and Shem, and there are their wives, there are the animals, and there's the fourth son, which in, um, in various kind of extra biblical uh, commentary and extra scriptural commentary, Noah is a fourth son who's an unbeliever. That's also in the Quran, and he doesn't get in the ark and, and he drowns. And so here's the drowned people. And you'll see that the skin color of all the sons of Noah, everybody has the same skin color. There's no sense of, of difference. Um, there's also this work uh, from Germany from the same century, later part of the century, 1493. Uh, in English, we call it the Nuremberg Chronicle. And here is uh, here is Shem. No, here is here is here basically the descendants of Ham. Uh, Chus, who's the fourth son of Ham, uh, who is, and this has had children via, four sons via his wife, or four children, sons via his wife. And here are their descendants, so the four sons, and then they're each one of their descendants. And you will see they all have light skin color. And it's really not until we get down to this particular person, Dadan, that we have somebody who's meant to look like a, a Black African, but there's no sense that, that person is degraded at all. So this is 1493. It's at a point when uh, the Germans are probably not thinking hard about the enslavement of, of, of Africans by Europeans that had already started to kick off uh, in a major way in Portugal, but Portugal is pretty far from Germany. So you don't really have the sense of the relationship between Ham, enslavement, and Blackness that you're going to see in later centuries. So, but blackness is of course very important to this particular work, which again is produced 15th or 16th century. Uh, perhaps it's independent of the translating slave trade, but it's certainly written in the context of, of Arab enslavement of, of Africans in the slave, slave trade that's running through basically the, the Near East and Africa through Central Asia. Um, we have on pages 9 and 18 to 19 stories of the origins of Black people and of Noah's curse. And here's how it's summarized in this work. It has to do in this, <clears throat> this telling with uh, Noah's not a drunkard because that would be bad for Islam, but rather he just falls asleep and the wind blows his cloak up and reveals his genitals. And two of his sons take it seriously and one of them laughs at him. And he curses the one who laughs, who's Ham. May God blacken your face and the faces of your descendants and make your progeny serve the progeny of your brother Shem, the child of your own mother and father. So this, in this version in uh, Saif ben Dietzan is explicitly about skin color and servitude. But then we look at the way that it talks about uh, the various dark-skinned people in this work. Um, they're not really presented as though they're barbaric, as though they're servile, as though they're less intelligent or animalistic or kind of more uh, less sensitive to pain um, or any of these kinds or primitive or any of these things that we see uh, ascribed to black people by white supremacists in centuries following. It's it sort of, it wants to sort of say blackness is a curse, but it doesn't really present black people in this text in a degraded way, so far as I can see, and we can talk about this in class. So you can look that there's a dark complexioned hermit who converts safe to proto-Islam. There are the various dark skinned women that he falls in love with, Shama and Tama. 
Um, and then we see safe dyed red like an Ethiopian while well, in the city of Kamar. So we understand that that particular city is inhabited by uh, people who have a darker skin color than he does. And there's really no sense that these people are backwards or barbaric or animalistic or anything like that. So it sort of wants to have it both ways. Um, and I think part of that has to do, if we look at this family tree, which I got from Heather, Helen Blatherwick's useful book, Prophets, Gods, and Kings in the uh, Sirat Seif Ibn Diyatsan, um, she could have taken this uh, family tree a little bit further back because we have Noah up here, and then we have Shem and Ham. And then the, uh, the descendants of Shem and Ham come together to form our hero, save Ibn Diyatsan. So he has, he has a, a Yemenite, a Yemeni uh, father and an African, African mother. And then you see all the various foster foster parents as well. And maybe don't look too much down below because there's some spoilers, but you may want to look at this family tree to understand some of what's happening. So the important thing to note is that this is not so much about a dominant group versus an other, but it's really about a family conflict. And the trajectory of this work is to bring the family back together. And I find that's, that's an interesting way to read this this particular work. And that's something that I get from Helen Blatherwick's book. And so this will be my last slide. Um, so she writes, while Noah's curse has often been used as the basis for arguments for racial superiority, and it might superficially appear to be used as a justification for racial warfare and safe, this does not hold true from a reading of the text. And so we can talk about whether or not that's a correct interpretation in which issues of the race or color of individual characters are not in themselves important. Now, I sort of disagree with that, right? And we'll talk more about that in class, but I wanna share this whole section with you. Thus, she writes, the emphasis placed on Noah's curse in the introductory section melds the essentially exclusionary concept of racial conflict with the unsafe, universal inclusionary concept of jihad by providing a subtext in which both can rest. That is a sort of, we have on the one hand, a story of separation and of religious conflict, which is kind of proto-Islam versus the worshipers of Saturn, light-skinned people versus dark-skinned people. But then they're finally brought together into a kind of universalized Islam. It enables both safe the hero and safe the sira, that's the work itself, to confirm the, conform the genre conventions while man manipulating them, kind of playing with it. So it's a sort of a work of separation and of unification where um, the notions of racial prejudice and white supremacy as we understand them in the present era are perhaps not operating in a way that we find familiar. So this is not to say this text is not racist. It certainly understands uh, dark skin as a curse, but its form of racism, its form forms of racial exclusion are not operating in the same way that they're gonna operate in modernity. They're in the era of translating slavery, right? They seem to be part of an earlier way of thinking about, about human difference. And we can talk about why that is and how that operates. But the key thing to recognize, of course, is something you've heard in other class, which is that race is not a biological difference. It's a cultural difference that masquerades as a biological difference to try to conceal its reliance on cultural difference. And those cultural difference of race, that uh, this category of race has to do with political power. And once you understand that it's a human construct, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Many human constructs are enormously powerful. Money, for example, is purely a human construct enormously powerful, enormously damaging, enormously rewarding to certain people. Same thing with race and racism. But once you understand that it's a human construct, that means it's something you can think about, you can trace its history, you can fight about, and maybe feel less trapped by or less beholden to it. So this is something we can also talk about in relation to this text. So I'm looking forward to our conversation on Thursday.